Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. My name is Susan Stigant. I'm the director of the Africa program here, and we're really delighted to have a room full of people who continue to care um, about South Sudan and how we can think about getting the country off of a path of violence um, and onto a path of more sustainable peace. And we have an excellent panel with us here in the room today. We have a colleague who's going to join us um, via Zoom. And we also are live streaming this. So for those of you who are joining us online, welcome. You can follow us um, with the hashtag USIP South Sudan. Um, and we'll be taking questions through that, that platform as well. So for those of you who don't know USIP, um, USIP was founded by the US Congress in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan national institute dedicated to resolving violent international conflicts. And we do this by working in conflict zones around the world, linking analysis and policy, research and training, and working with local partners. The foundation of our work is the knowledge that peace is possible. It's not easy. It requires significant action and over a long period of time, but it is possible. And one of the places where we do this is in Africa. And for our Africa program, no place reminds us more about the horrific costs of war, but also the courageous efforts that are being made towards peace. So today we're going to focus in a little bit on a country that I think many of you in the room are familiar with, um, a country that was born in 2011 um, that slid into a civil war in 2013 and where at least 400,000 people have been killed as a result of that war. Um, this has resulted in the latest reports of 60% of the population uh, facing food insecurity, the largest displacement of people since the Rwandan genocide, and ongoing indicators that the space for civil society, the space for the people who are truly working for peace, is incredibly constrained. And so just um, to name a few of those, those most recent indications that we've seen, um, in the last month, we saw the conviction of Peter Biar, um, Kirbino Wool, and several others um, as a really strong indicator of the challenging space faced by civil society. At the same time, the recent report of the UN Panel of Experts brought forward evidence of continued concerns related to sanctions, as well as evidence that Agre Idri and Dong Samuel were killed. Similarly, in February 2019, the report of the UN Commission in, uh, on Human Rights in South Sudan found that the continuing violence and human rights violations, including rape and sexual violence, may amount to war crimes. So too often, these violations are numbers, they're descriptions in a report, um, but for many people who are joining us today, these are colleagues, these are friends, these are family. And so I think to acknowledge the really horrific consequences of, of conflict and violence, um, I'd like to invite us to take a moment to acknowledge those who have been lost over the course of this war. But what brings us here today um, is not just an acknowledgement of that loss, but also um, an inspiration of the tremendous courage that people are showing against some of the hardest challenges that we face. So if we look back to the last several years, we've seen the revitalization of the peace agreement um, that is meant to get South Sudan on a path towards peace, led primarily by Uganda and Sudan. Now, with the tectonic shifts that are taking place in the Horn of Africa, many people are questioning what role Sudan and Uganda can play to help to keep this peace process moving forward. And at the same time, we hear two narratives about the peace agreement. One narrative that says, this is an agreement, key people have signed, it helps to end the violence, and people should make use of that space to try to get the country back on a path towards peace. Um, that it creates a little bit of an, a moment for those who are pushing for peace to, to make some traction. We hear another narrative that is maybe a luxury of a narrative here in Washington, that this agreement was never going to make things better in the country, fundamentally. Um, that these arrangements have been tried 
before, and they have failed not once, but twice. And so why would we think that they would hold, much less put the country on a path towards transformation um, and fundamentally changing and improving the lives of South Sudanese? And so today we're not going to try to, to judge which one is the right narrative or the wrong narrative, but just to acknowledge that there, there are different views about the path forward for the country um, of South Sudan and to try to think through how can we motivate, mobilize and animate this stalled peace process. So I now have the pleasure of, of introducing our panelists today. Um, immediately to my left, David Achwath, who's the founder of the Council on South Sudanese American Relations, and who has been leading an initiative um, with South Sudanese diaspora on dialogue. Uh, Morgan Simpson, who is the Deputy Director of Democracy International. Brian Adeba, who is the Deputy Director of Policy at the Enough Project. And Mark Forello, who's the Senior Advisor at the Century Project. We're also joined by Dr. Emily Koyiti, um, who participated in the negotiations of the revitalized agreement, um, and she also served on JMEC um, during the implementation of the original agreement. So I'm going to open it up to our panel. We'll have a bit of a conversation, and then we look forward to, to engaging all of you in the discussion. Um, last week, the United Nations issued a report on the humanitarian situation in the country and indicated that 60% of the population, 7 million people, don't consistently have food to feed themselves. Um, so this is one marker of what's happening in the country, but what, what is the overall feeling in, in South Sudan? Um, and maybe I'll turn to Brian to, to start us off. Well, um, I think um, there is a, a, some optimism about the peace agreement in that um, the level of violence has uh, subsided and the uh, cessation of hostilities agreement seems to be holding. Um, however, there are many other concerns. Um, uh, freedom of association is still an issue. Infringement on uh, liberties in South Sudan by um, authorities and security agencies is still an issue of concern. But uh, more important, importantly is uh, the increase in cattle rustling. And um, that's the next security threat uh, for South Sudan and the policymakers that are currently look, looking at um, drafting a new defense policy and all that have to look at that and identify it as a source of uh, threat to the security of the country and has to, uh, has to be countered. The problem with cattle rustling and its um, increase is the fact that it's being militarized at this particular point. Uh, it involves communities and it transcends the, um, the, the, um, the old ways of how it was uh, carried out, and that right now the actors in it have sophisticate we sophisticated weapons, and uh, there is evidence to suggest the involvement of politicians uh, in, in the cultural wrestling. So that's, those are some of the key issues coming up right now. David, does that match with what you hear as you talk to folks who are in South Sudan and to South Sudanese who are watching what's happening in South Sudan from the United States? Uh, I think you're good. Uh, thank you, Susan. I think I do. I agree with the, the uh, Brian assessment of the situation, but I would just add that one of the beneath the surface of the idea that there is no conflict in South Sudan, uh, the violence has resi uh, resided in Juba right now. That message has actually gone to refugees camp and you have a great number of people from the camps running back to Juba and, South, and other cities in South Sudan. And what I'm hearing from the ground is that that has created an economic problem because there is no enough food for people to eat. And that actually led to so many young children on the street begging and actually stealing. So at the same time, in the absence of uh, you know hearing the voice, the sound of guns in the city, there is continuing crisis beneath the surface that is related to economic and food shortages. Um, Dr. Emily, uh, do you have any insights in terms of how, how people inside of South Sudan are, are seeing the situation right now? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? We can hear you well, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the, the feeling on the ground for most of the people is that, yes, indeed, there is reduced uh, violence, but there are other fears that are not necessarily related to the agreement per se. Uh, we have the rains that are on, and of course, there is uh, impending 
famine with many lacking food and basics. Uh, much as people are returning they, from the refugee camps, they are not well aware of the challenges they could possibly face when they get back home. And uh, when they arrive, then they realize that, oh, this is what we are facing. And then they arrive to places which do not necessarily have all uh, the necessities for, for living a dignified life. We still have places uh, in Upper Nile, even in the equatorias that are civilian owned ordinarily, but are still occupied by the different armed groups. And as of today, in the RDMEC meeting, the, the, the report from Citizen and the CDC was already showing that uh, the government side itself has still occupies a, a good a good number of civilian buildings, and with that going on, those are fears are uh, related to the agreement and also some that I've highlighted that are not necessarily related to the situation of conflict, but generally there has been reduced uh, fighting between the parties, and that's a good sign. Thanks, Dr. Emily. Um, I was I was looking back at an event we did almost two years ago um, with some South Sudanese activists, and someone then had said, "You can't have dialogue when the guns are still singing." Um, and certainly, reducing some of the level of violence because of the political conflict is progress, but um, the, the obstacles that remain are, are really significant. Um, Morgan, you, you travel back and forth um, between the United States and, and Juba. From the perspective of an organization that's implementing programming to support civil society, how, how do you see the situation in the country? Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, my colleagues have it exactly right. Um, people are excited that um, it seems that violence has reduced. Uh, the economic situation, however, continues to pose serious problems for everyday life. Um, and local level conflicts still continue to be an issue. Uh, in terms of the peace agreement, I think uh, there's sort of a general sense that extending the pre-transitional period was the right decision. But um, our partners are watching very closely to see that there's actually a concrete plan in place to make sure that the steps that weren't completed during the first part of the pre-transitional period are actually completed this time. Um, we've seen more movement in the agreement's implementation as compared to 2015. But um, some of the hardest, hardest things to implement in terms of security sector reform, um, creating the boundaries for, for the states, those things still haven't haven't been implemented, and our partners definitely want to see movement on those those issues in the next few months. So, so let's turn to that a little bit in terms of the peace agreement itself. As you noted, the pre-transition period has been extended for another six months. The full term of the agreement remains the same. Um, and I, I believe that uh, JMEC indicated that about 44% of the agreement had been implemented as, as people went into these negotiations. So um, I'm curious from this, this program that's, that's being supported by the Voluntary Civil Society Task Force on the implementation of the peace agreement under the Peace Implementation Monitoring Initiative. So that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> It's PIMI, P-I-M-I, -I, and um, we can refer people to the website if they're interested in reading the details of the report, but interested to hear a little bit more about um, how your partners are seeing the status of implementation, where, wh where are areas of progress, what are core gaps, and what are, what are some of the fundamental barriers to making progress? Um, I think, so as compared in particular to the 2015 agreement, as I said, the task force, the, the PME group, um, began their work under that agreement, uh, monitoring its implementation and really the lack thereof, uh, and calling out sort of the failures to, to implement it. Um, and sort of as a result of that, they have become very, very much engaged in the whole revitalization process. And now the, um, the implementation of the revitalized agreement, I think we've seen um, a lot more civil society engagement in the process this time around, including there's a lot better representation of civil society, of academia, of women um, on the committees formed under the revitalized agreement, which is significant progress in, in their view and in our view. Um, in terms of the barriers, like I said, the main things are, are the security sector reform, the, um, you know, the cantonment sites, the deoccupation, as, as Emily pointed out, of soldiers in civilian spaces, those are sort of some of the priority priority issues and the formation of states. I think that's one of the most controversial issues. Um, 
and it's it's going to be very difficult for for that to go through smoothly, but it needs to happen in order to be able to move forward with forming a government. Um, I think the other thing that, that's particularly important is implementation of Chapter 5 in terms of the transitional justice mechanisms. Um, that's a chapter that uh, sees particular resistance to implementation um, because of its emphasis on accountability. Um, but I think there are ways, particularly um, through civil society to to move forward with certain elements of it, in particular the CTRH, the Commission on Truth, Reconciliation and Healing, moving forward with reconciling among the population of building a sense of nationhood beyond tribal lines that um, would at least help move forward in the transitional justice process without maybe immediately going to the, to the hybrid court, which is definitely going to be difficult. Um, Dr. Emily, you've you've observed and been involved in in JMEC, um and in other phases of this this peace agreement. Um, do you have any reflections on what some of the fundamental barriers are to going forward, and and where where would you see the the scorecard right now of where we stand? Um, I I I can't give a very clear projection of what the scorecard is right now, but uh, the situation, to me, it still doesn't give uh, much hope, uh, given the time we are left with and we have to extend for six months. The barriers that we have at the moment is that uh, there is there is uh, the NPTC is supposed to provide resources uh, for a lot of work to be done during the pre-transitional period. And what we are seeing is that very little has been remitted for activities to be done. Uh, until now, the report we got today is that uh, cantonment sites do not have the basics, they do not have water, they do not have food. And those are things that the uh, soldiers will be cantoned with need. And then uh, one thing that people also don't talk about among us, the things that uh, are really prerequisites before we <laughs> we think about uh, November being possible for us to form a, tra uh, a revitalized transition government of national unity is the fact that there is supposed to be some legislative reforms that are at the moment being undertaken, spearheaded by the National Constitutional Amendment Committee. Uh, but what we are seeing is that the amendment bill, for example, has been sent back uh, there is contention about uh, some issues on the National Security Service Bill, and all these are all these are very important uh, for securing the space that is required for a revitalized transitional government of national unity to thrive, and then for parties to be able to implement an agreement in in a space that is in an environment that is conducive. And of course, the other things that colleagues have talked about, like uh, the cantonment sites and the state's formation. And also, the, fa the other thing is that uh, there are commissions that are yet to be formed. At least uh, we, we are glad that a uh, few weeks ago, there was an uh, uh, initiative taken to, to form the, to reconstitute the, the DDR commission. And we are still awaiting for parties to be able to uh, to select among the nominees who different stakeholders and parties submitted to the NPTC. But uh, much as IGAD had uh, given a tentative timetable for that to happen, we are also uh, concerned that the parties are still not doing it with the urgency that is required. Ordinarily by today, not tomorrow, uh, uh, the first the DDR commission should should be should be should have its inaugural meeting the constituted DDR commission, but that is not possible because until today we do not know who is the selected deputy chair and chairperson of the expected uh, new commission. So all those are things that are there, and uh, parties do not seem to they are not giving exact reasons as to why they are not able to do all these things, particularly the NPTC that is meant to spearhead all this work in the pre-transitional pe period. So Thanks. it's still a grim picture. Thanks, Emily. Um, when, when we do work thinking about power-sharing governments, we, we often make the observation that forming a power-sharing government is only one step. It's not actually the objective and the, the outcome that you want. It is to form a government that can make 
and implement decisions effectively, which um, it strikes me if I'm going to be a little bit of the devil's advocate here, we're effectively getting committees and commissions in place, slowly by slowly, and that, that matters in the midst of a deeply divided context, but the ability to move those decisions forward seems to be, um, seems to be lacking. Um, Brian, I want to pick up on the point about um, security sector, because um, this, this seems to be the question that everybody is focused on, and there is tremendous energy thinking about what needs to be done to allow for security in Juba in particular, that would open the space for SPLM IO in particular to come back. Um, what, what are your thoughts about priorities in terms of security sector in, in these next six months? And, and what needs to happen to, to move that ahead? Um, let me just touch on a few items uh, in security sector reform. Um, notable in the process uh, to reform the security sector as um, announced in the peace agreement is the absence or reference to the National Security Service of South Sudan. And that's very problematic. Uh, we know that um, the act that governs the National Security Service um, is quite oppressive. It has uh, certain tenants in it that are uh, an infringement of, on civil liberties. For instance, um, the act uh, insinuates or suggests that if anyone is in NIS custody, it's not the responsibility of the NIS to feed them, for instance. Um, it can also um, allow the NIS to hold people indefinitely in custody. So those are very problematic um, items with, with, with reference to the legislation, that the framework that governs the NIS. The second problematic item about it is how the NIS has emerged as a parallel army um, in the service of the president. And I don't want to say this because um, I'm being critical of the system. I think that genuinely, if you look at what the system faced, was a number of threats to it, internal and external. The internal threats came from civil society, from the public, uh, that was um, you know, angry at the infringement of civil, civil liberties um, in the, as announced in the Constitution or stipulated in the Constitution. The other threat, of course, was the physical threat posed by the insurrection. And so, given those two threats facing the system, it um, evolved the nature of the needs from information gathering and analysis to policing. So now we have a militarized needs. Its size remained um, unknown to the public for a long time um, until the UN panel of experts report came out. And lo and behold, we have a whole division, which is like 10 to 12,000 men uh, under the service of the NIS. The NIS has its own procurement system that's very different from the normal procurement system for the army. Um, the NIS, on paper, technically answers to the national, uh, to the Minister of National Security. In reality, it answers directly to the office of the president. That's where its budget is. The budget of the office of the president, when audited, is never made public. And so that presents a lot of issues with, with, in terms of um, oversight. Um, the legislation says that the NIS um, should be um, supervised by a committee in the National Legislative Assembly. Now, um, that has, there is very little evidence um, given some of the egregious acts that are attributed to the NIS to suggest that it has ever been called to account. It's uh, emerged as a very shadowy organization uh, since the appointment of its leader. There is, he's never given a press conference. Uh, when uh, compelled to speak to the public, like recently when they released uh, a number of political detainees, um, um, the spokespeople that were there, the news spokespeople, prevented reporters from taking pictures. And we heard some reports that they wore masks. So this uh, encapsulates a very um, significant problem going forward. And in the panel of experts report, we also got to learn that the NIS does not consider itself as part of the security sector reform process. So if we're talking of reforming the security sector in the whole country, and we have a whole division, um, which is like 10,000 men, and the South Sudanese army has maybe like 120,000 um, 
people and uh, uh, has about um, eight or ten divisions, eight divisions. And here we have an extra division at the service of the president, the president's own personal police. We have a problem going forward. And I think as the security sector review um, process is uh, ongoing at the moment, it behooves of uh, those who are participating in it to reflect a little and consider how they can um, go forward with uh, bringing the NIS into the fold. Otherwise, if we go ahead with this reform process, and it has significant implications for the security of, um, of those who are going to come to Juba, um, uh, who, uh, from the opposition, from the armed opposition, who's going to provide security. They're talking of a joint force, uh, 12,000. I, I, I read in the news recently that they, talk, they want a, a force, to, a VIP force of about 12,000. Does the, where does the news come into this? These are questions that deserve answers and we don't have them at this particular point. I think it's um, really interesting to think through how the, the questions that are being asked uh, about how those who are returning to Juba can be safe um, can open a space for a conversation about what can a security sector, what does the security sector need to look like in South Sudan so that um, people uh, run, start again to run towards um, security officials rather than running away from them. Mark, I want to bring you into the conversation because we've We've been focused a little narrowly here, but um, several analysts have made the point that we got to the revitalized agreement because the reality on the ground fundamentally shifted. In many ways, the government of South Sudan won the war, but hasn't been able to win the peace. And so the agreement reflects a fundamentally shift, a fundamental shift in the power dynamics. Um, and if we, if we understand it in that way, I think this helps maybe to explain where we are in terms of implementation. And you've done a lot of work to look at the economic sector um, and how vested and how closely tied the economic se sector and the government are. So can you share some of the, the insights from, from your research on that and sure, help I'd, us understand where we are? Yeah. Uh, so I think I'll probably add to the litany of uh, issues here. We talked about security, political, humanitarian issues at play. Um, what uh, the research I've done um, at the Century uh, has looked at sort of the economics of the conflict itself. Um, uh, I like to say the Century looks behind the, or under the hood uh, of how the system itself is functioning. And what we find is, as, as you mentioned, um, there's one side, the government, which is in control of a lot of the economic resources, which alone is a problem. But on top of that, uh, there's this sense in South Sudan that if you are in the political leadership, if you have the political levers, you then are in control of the economic levers. That makes being outside of the government more uh, a, a bigger risk than it might, not, might be otherwise. Um, so what we found is, you know, in the oil sector, for example, uh, Nile Pet is still not opening its books. The IMF just put out a report uh, at the beginning of June where the number one source of revenue for the country um, is opaque. This sort of lack of transparency has led us to a belief that there should be a greater focus on the uh, uh, economic governance in the country, which I saw everyone's eyes just glaze over when I said economic governance. <laughs> but what I'm, this is important because um, economic governance are the regulations, the institutions that uh, guide and monitor a fair, transparent, accountable government uh, and economy. And uh, a peace agreement built on a uh, poor economic gover uh, governance structure uh, uh, not only is bad for the economy, it makes growth harder, development harder, but within the South Sudan context actually makes violence more likely to come back. And so because uh, of this, this threat that there's this cycle, we're concerned um, that the sort of unaddressed corruption uh, risks undermining aspects of the peace agreement. Luckily, there is a chapter that is completely focused on this, but, um, you know, to no fault to the panelists or any, you know, anyone, it's the last thing we're talking about. And that's a concern, uh, I think, that we have, that chapter four, which has this framework for natural resources, for fiscal management, it's very complex, maybe purposely so, to make it um, harder to implement, but it is very complex, but it has the infrastructure to be able to um, reform step-by-step step how the, the, the economic system itself works. Um, I think there's timing is right now to focus on it. Um, as the, I think we'll get more into opportunities and, 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 and kind of recommendations, but um, it might seem a little tone deaf to talk about these things when there's still not, you know, um, 
uh, there are groups outside of the, of the agreement, containment hasn't been figured out, Juba security, you know, uh, the, the vice president isn't even in the country, um, but we think actually now is the right time. Uh, and, and that's more because of how it's an opportunity for, for deep engagement. So we've already set forth a massive agenda of the things that need to be addressed and done. And one of the critiques of the agreement is that there is more in there than can ever be implemented by in a single transition period by a single government, even in the best of moments. So I, I want to ask our panelists to, to reflect a little bit on what, what should the priorities for action be between now and the end of this extended pre-transition period. In, in concrete terms, what, what needs the greatest attention? Um, and I'd, I'd love your thoughts um, as, as people who represent different aspects um, and have insights on different aspects, whether it's civic action, JMEC and its own capacity, the political leadership, regional bodies, um, international partner engagement. Um, so Dr. Emily, I'm going to, to turn to you first um, to, to get your thoughts on this. Oh, uh, that's to me? Yes, please. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I would like to say that uh, I do not agree with this notion that uh, there is just too much in the agreement that can't be implemented by uh, even if we had the best government ever. Uh, I say this because in, in the first months of uh, this uh, uh, after, after September 12th last year, we had uh, the NCSC commence its work, that's the National Constitution Amendment Committee, and 15 members managed to sit down for 21 days and draft the Constitution Amendment Bill in 21 days, 15 people. It's because they knew the weight of the matter at hand and they had no reason to create reasons whatsoever and they had to do their part because it's all about attaining peace in our country. So all these excuses that uh, uh, parties come around with, there is no money, there is no this, if, if indeed there are parties who are willing and they, they would like to put all barriers aside, the ones that they seem to be creating, we would be able to move several steps ahead. So that I want to underscore that let to me, no, nobody should buy that idea that that the agreement is just too big to be implemented. If we had parties who are willing, a lot of work can be done and we can get a lot done. Now, what should be the priorities? Uh, everything that must be implemented in the pre-transitional pre period is a priority. We negotiated a peace agreement knowing that all those things are very important and are prerequisites to formation of a transitional government, of, of a revitalized transitional government of national unity. To say one is more important than the other is to, is, 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 is really impossible. So for, for me, the priority should be about emphasizing to these parties that it's going to be at their own peril if anything that is supposed to happen in the pre-transition period does not get to be achieved. And then they reluctantly decide to form a transitional government of national unity with the assumption that they are going to sort so many things later because that is going to be a recipe for disaster. For those of us who are sitting here and, uh, and are watching from a distance or are engaging them here and there, the second priority is to there has to be a special <laughs> engagement. Brian talked about the National Security Service and uh, what he expressed is very right that uh, the National Security Service does not consider itself uh, as uh, um, uh, mandatory to all the reforms that are supposed to be done and neither does it even uh, see itself bound by the provisions of the peace agreement. And yet today when civil society wants to hold meetings uh, that are that are meant to disseminate the peace agreement, then they 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 are required to get permission from the National Security Service. And there are individuals within the civil society who have been blacklisted in such a way that if they are on an agenda of a meeting that is about the peace agreement, for example, that meeting will not be approved. So if there is no special conversation that is conducted with the National Security Service leadership and also the presidents that, over, that oversees this whole body. 
then it's it's really going to be an obstacle to progress of implementation of the agreement. I will leave it at this and uh, let the other colleagues take over with uh, other interventions. Thanks, Emily, and thank you so, for saying so forcefully and firmly that peace is possible um, and that it is our job to, to remind political leadership that it's, it's possible when there is will to drive that forward. Um, so uh, open it up to, to others. I'd, I'd love thoughts about um, if you agree with, with this analysis, how do we start to create a moment where there is leadership um, at the political level to take the agreement forward? Okay. I, um, for me, I think when you have an agreement where there are four vice presidents, that by itself is going to be a ticking bomb because whether you reform the government outside in Cuba or you have Riyak Machar coming, that by itself is going to be a problem. But this is better than 2015. And for me, what I think that the priorities should be is that back in February, the UN panel was reporting that there were these mini dialogue between the military inside South Sudan. So you have soldiers from the SPLMIO and those from the government at the senior level. There were meetings in the bushes and talking about the containment process. And one of the things that they continually brought up in those discussions was the absence of resources. That even if they bring the amend, what are they going to eat? Where are they going to sleep? So I really think that the international community should focus on putting resources into that process because these men will be willing, actually, if they accept to dialogue among themselves, if you give them resources, probably that could allow the process of the peace to be contained while you work on the process of bringing Dr. Riyak Mashar to Juba. And, and, and that process, and also, I also think that another focus should be focused uh, uh, on the issue of um, uh, political identity with its emphasis on, on, on tribal identity. And this is one of the things that we in the diaspora have been dealing with, that, 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 that there are ground soldiers, the foot soldiers of the conflict in South Sudan are people from different communities not, not accepting one another. So the emphasis on creating a political dialogue should also be prioritized in the, while you focus on, 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 on military and, and ending violence. There, is, there must also be a focus on bringing a political dialogue so that people can stop this idea of us versus them or them, you know, or we, you know, this community, we are better than that. Because if you don't change the narrative from us versus them, you can have all the political, you know, parties in Yuba, but again, the boiling point will still burst to flame because these people will continue to talk about us versus them, who have the resources, who have been killed and who is what. So I really think that those two should be prioritized. The priority, number one, should be focusing on military containment, and priority number two will be to focus on creating a political dialogue that is based on forgiveness and reconciliations. And that drives us directly back to the question of security, because if I, I think about how challenging it has been to even have that conversation in the United States where presumably people feel safe speaking their, their hearts and their minds, um, imagine it in the context where people are still fearful. Um, so I, I also want to invite um, others on the panel to, to weigh in here, and um, on the specific issue of cantonment, um, there's, I think, important to make sure that those who have guns are isolated and agree to buy into this process. But understandably, there's quite a bit of skepticism about that process and how it actually, in, in past, has created incentive to recruit additional people. And we've seen pretty clear evidence of forced recruitment um, in, in parts of the country over the last, over the, pre, the original pre-transition period. Um, so how, how do we balance some of those, those issues to move forward what needs to happen without creating a bloated um, security? I think okay. prolonging the uh, cantonment process opens up uh, the opportunity for um, extra recruitment. It's all about jobs at, at this particular point. Um, everyone is seeing that down the line, if I'm in uniform and I'm in the cantonment camp, um, I might get a job. And so prolonging it is a problem and the government needs to step up and uh, put the resources that are required. Um, it promised that it was going to uh, disperse about $100, um, $100, $100 million for the process. 
And uh, what has happened, it's been maybe two months since that um, promise was made and we've seen no forward movement on it. Um, the cantonment is supposed to be complete by, completed by uh, July 15th, and that's when the joint training of the forces uh, should ensue. Um, we are almost a month away from that, and there's not a lot of movement. Um, some countries have offered support, Egypt, no, sorry, Rwanda, uh, Nigeria, Algeria, uh, I think Ethiopia, five countries have offered some support, and there was a meeting last week uh, in Addis uh, between um, representatives of those countries and members from the, uh, from the, um, from the uh, security review board to see what the demands are. Um, but but that's, that's going to be really um, small uh, support uh, coming from, um, I think, neighboring, mostly these countries were, are neighboring countries from Africa. Um, <laughs> So, so the international community, I think, has there is space. I think where 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 help is really critically needed is in the security sector. In terms of even, you know, the philosophy behind what kind of army do the South Sudanese really need going forward, um, and and uh, cantonment is uh, you know support for the cantonment process can be conducted in a manner in which um, third parties are involved because of the reputation of the government in handling. Uh, any money that is donated to it, it's, it's um, and I will not mince my words here, it's a very corrupt system. Mm -hmm. The next thing that really needs to happen is for the government to show up its own credibility by uh, really taking concrete steps to arrest the corruption that's happening uh, in South Sudan. <coughs> Weekly, there isn't, um, you know, there is always something coming out, an expose of a scandal happening within government offices. And um, the government is just seen as, as, as a non-committed to uh, taking the steps to combat corruption. And, and this is going to be a problem because when you have the public coffers uh, uh, being looted by a few individuals, that, that creates a competitive sort of um, um, quest uh, you know, for, for, for others to join to want to take control of the state. And we, we need concrete actions to, to to, to be uh, taken on that, and as we move from now to the um, to November 12, the international community also needs to be aware of the spoilers that might keep cropping up um, in the system or within any of the parties. We hear that there is no money for cantonment, there's no money for the peace pro process, yet we see government ministers. Uh, authorizing millions of dollars for other purposes that are not really related to the peace agreement. And the peace agreement should be like the most critical aspect in the hands of the government right now. Yet we have its senior officials um, diverting or, you know, uh, diverting money for other purposes. And I think we need, the government needs to get its, uh, get its priorities correct and right at this particular moment. So when we have those spoilers at work, the international community should also take measures to enact financial pressures on, on these people, targeted financial pressures that go after the individuals, that go after the entities that, they, that support them to get money out to the global financial system. And, and this should be concerted, um, should be escalated actually if we see these um, spoilers at work. Thank you. Mark, I know this is the, the bread and butter of what you've been researching and thinking about. What, um, building off of what Brian said, what, what would that look like a little bit more? How could that pressure re be brought to bear effectively? Yeah, it's interesting because Brian's talking about a financial gap the government has, but I'll throw out another gap, which is there's a trust gap with the international community. And how you bring those two together is both, in, in our view, um, financial pressures. So there are the spoilers. There are those who meant to be contoning troops but aren't or those who should be a part of the process and aren't. Um, but then there's also incentives sort of built into how the economy works. And we've already seen South Sudan um, reaching out for more um, stabilization funds or development funds from places like the African Development Bank, African XM Bank. Um, they're going to ask for an IMF um, um, stabilization uh, li uh, line of credit at some point. I'm, I haven't heard of that yet, but we have to assume it'll come. And these actually are opportunities um, because while well, at the same time there is a sort of sanctioning that goes on to make sure that the, the parties um, stay committed. Um, necessarily so, the international community has an ability as well to use 
um, the financial incentives uh, to make sure that some of those issues that need to be a priority um, are a priority. And the, the advantage here about using sort of international funds or loans or credit is that it can come with some sort of um, oversight, a safeguard, uh, the sort of things I was talking about earlier, where uh, with a line there is a level of accountability that follows behind it. Um, I will say, I'll just add in here a little bit, is uh, it still needs someone to be really in charge of it. Um, and I think appointing uh, an envoy, perhaps an African Union envoy, completely focused on transparency is a good way of keeping the PR uh, element focused on uh, the economic governance in the country. Because um, I think what we see in South Sudan is there's a dispersal of, uh, of where funds come from, who's paying for what. S South Sudan has made some good steps, um, getting the revenue authority in line, um, um, updating the procurement bill. But that's sort of, those are the initial steps and there's a lot more that needs to go along the way. And I think um, it can't be seen as a separate path. It's concurrent with contoning troops because one of the disputes here is there's not enough money. And so if you're able to uh, support the South Sudanese government, I think civil society has a big role here too because civil society has been highlighting the role of corruption for so long. And so if it's a passionate issue for a lot of uh, South Sudan society and there's international community wants to find a way that's safe, that can build a little trust um, back with South Sudan, this might be one of those elements. And I think the point's been made that um, despite all the challenges, there is an activism among South Sudanese and a level of organization that I think is is really encouraging. Um, and I was struck when we had some colleagues here a couple of months ago where um, <coughs> colleagues in the United States government were saying, were trying to explain why the U.S. didn't sign as a guarantor in the peace agreement. And the South Sudanese said, that's not your job. The government is accountable to us for implementation. It's, it doesn't need to be accountable to the United States. We need you to play your role diplomatically and in terms of assistance that's required. But ultimately, we have to create a relationship where the government is accountable to the people of South Sudan. Um, so, Morgan, I want to turn back to you. And, and are there any results from the PME report that, that point particularly towards the economic governance side? Is this an area where your partners are able to get some visibility and some traction? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The, the citizens themselves, they're tired of the conflict and they're also hopeful about this agreement, for better or for worse. Um, it is showing sort of more progress than, than the past agreement and, and they're out there and ready to sort of push for it to be implemented. Um, the economic issue is definitely one of their sort of priority challenges that they've highlighted in terms of making sure there is funding for implementation and that any funding that is towards implementation is transparently managed um, and that it actually goes towards the, the implementation of the agreement and not into the pockets of, of the leaders. Um, and so that's definitely something that our partners are calling out and highlighting um, and they've called for in their most recent report. Um, and I think sort of more broadly, civil society is very strong in South Sudan. Uh, they, in a lot of ways, they've filled sort of the governance gaps, um, both at the local level and the national level. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there for, as we're putting pressure on the leaders to implement, to also continue to empower civil society to take the lead in advocating for themselves, for advocating for the agreement to be implemented, and to address the issues that everyday citizens are facing, both in terms of hunger and um, jobs, economic issues, et cetera. So let me push you on that a little bit. What does it mean to empower civil society to do that? What what can folks in this room and in this country be doing to to give civil society? And I assume we're using that in the kind of small C, small S, not just registered civic organizations, but also some of these uh, movements and less formal mechanisms that are that are emerging in South Sudan. Yeah, I mean, I think with the great humanitarian crisis, there's been a lot of emphasis from the international community um, in pouring money into addressing humanitarian issues, providing humanitarian aid, which is definitely a need, but it doesn't fix the problem. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're also supporting other organizations, other groups to move the country forward on its path to development. Um, there are organizations that are making progress in addressing development issues. Um, and I think that, that we need to be working together to make sure that, that we're not 
taking away from that because we're concerned about the national level governance issues. Um, there is a way to work on governance issues through civil society um, without just taking it all away, I guess. So financial and technical support? Is that okay? okay. <laughs> I'll say it if you can't. Um, um, <laughs> I could also add to that, yes. Um, I think uh, focusing on technical leadership skills for civil society is very important. But for the international community also need to be, you know, write out condemnation worldwide. If you have situation like what happened to PWR, who is a high profile civil society leader and uh, Carbino Wall and others. So, uh, and, and the, the, the security apparatus in South Sudan, they monitored international reaction. So what will strengthen civil society is an international you know, wide condemnation to, you know, to, to the horrible treatment of civil society leaders, but also putting resources into technical leadership development skills. So I, I have two, two questions before we turn it and, and open it up to our audience. Um, and I'm going to ask our panelists now to zoom out um, and expand our aperture a bit because we, we so often get caught on the immediate and real crises that are before us, the economic, the humanitarian, the security, the political. I mean, it keeps us all incredibly busy. Um, but we rarely take a moment to think through a horizon beyond the next six months much less the next 30 months, much less where we envision South Sudan could be in five years or 10 years. Um, and so I'd like your reflections about what, what should, should we as partners, what should we as, as South Sudanese, what should we be aiming for in a horizon that looks um, to the end of the term of the peace agreement and then bridges us beyond that? Um, I'm not going to name anybody. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you volunteer I'll yourselves for this one. There. Um, I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one, which uh, is getting the Border Commission right and getting that finished. Um, it is so fundamental to how the country will look in five, ten years um, if it's done in the appropriate manner. Um, it'll decide how resources are split, um, which groups have different governors. Um, and that could be a game changer in terms of stability in the country. Now that's actually outside of my normal focus, but I say that because it's connected to the other aspects that I think are really important, which is getting the economic governance, not surprisingly broken record, uh, right here. And so within those timelines, um, uh, focusing on transparency now is as important for the first six months as it is for 10 years from now. So that there's an actual sense of what is uh, what is an accountable government when it comes to public money. Um, you know, one of the recommendations we make in the paper that was out, out front and hopefully you take a look at is uh, to build an e-transparency system. Now, South Sudan doesn't have the internet penetration for, have, for that to have the greatest effect, but the idea in part is that if you get public records, um, um, corporate records, you get asset declarations, mining concessions, oil data in real time, it supports civil society to be able to put pressure on leaders. And that sort of infrastructure is something I think the international community do now. And it won't make or break the peace agreement, but five years down the line, 10 years down the line, there could be a culture of change about what it comes when government um, um, financing looks like. And as a citizen, what you can expect um, to see and make available. Mark's lucky because his talking point will be the same 10 years from now as it is today, which is, <laughs> your job is done. Um, I'm going to turn to Dr. Emily to see if she'd like to, to come in here. Emily, are you still there? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Because oh, from your end, I keep breaking. Oh, okay. Um, beyond beyond the pre-transition period, I just want to say that uh, compared to the RCS days, uh, right now during the RCS the uh, uh, period, we have a more proactive civil society, which unfortunately is still uh, constrained uh, by several things, the, the civic space on the ground, 
but also the fact that there is a limited uh, funding. Most of the funding or support goes to the humanitarian assistance and those who work in the humanitarian sector, okay? But uh, folks who are engaged in uh, a, a governance-related uh, uh, stuff or things that we can talk of, uh, the, the are not getting adequate support. Yet they have, there is the energy, there is the enthusiasm to work on these things. So I think if there is flexible support that can be channeled to civil society to begin to prepare in anticipation of, what, of the activities that are supposed to happen in the pre-transition, in the transition period, it would be, uh, it would, it would help in expediting how fast and how much achievement we could make uh, if at all we make it to forming a, to forming a government and later on a, 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 a commencing the transition period. And to me, that kind of support could be uh, uh, for civil society to begin to look at the, all the legislation that must be reviewed. Uh, if, we are not, if we don't watch out, NCF is going to be caught behind uh, time. It will not be able to do the work it's supposed to do within 12 months before it's disbanded. And if civil society is supported to do that, that would be very useful. However, I also can't sit here as one member of civil society and uh, uh, explicitly uh, mention what the civil society needs. Partners should be able to engage all civil society who are now in form of organizations, civil organizations, but also uh, in, in the advent of the RRCs in form of coalitions to ask them what flexible support in the context of the RRC would look like uh, for us to be able to envision uh, the kind of success that we all want to see in the days of the transition period. I think that would be very, very important uh, besides everything else, because we know that government is not going to provide civil society with their support, uh, and civil society is looking out to partners uh, to, to assist them, and yet they could uh, give so much mileage to the whole process if only they are uh, supported. Thanks, Dr. Emily. I'm going to go down the line here um, with quick interventions, Brian. Um, I think I think that um, for the South Sudan that we want uh, to exist, um, some of the things that need to happen right now is reform of the institutions of accountability. We've seen constantly that the government um, um, has um, has has been on the path of basically looting public coffers. So we need a reform of the institutions of accountability. Um, these institutions right now have been captured by the state. So what we have in South Sudan is actually a kleptocracy. So to reform these institutions, what needs to happen is we need to empower them in terms of how the leadership of these institutions are appointed. Um, right now what happens is that it's cronies and uh, people close to the system that are appointed for the purpose to look uh, to, to enhance the looting of state coffers, to make them look the other way. So we need the legislation to be improved on that. And we also need these institutions to be resourced. Um, so far, uh, what we have seen is that, for instance, take the National Audit Chamber. According to the Constitution, the National Audit Chamber is supposed to audit the accounts of government every year and make those accounts public. That has not happened since 2012. And um, the reason that we got to learn um, on that is that the, uh, the Audit Chamber did not have the resources. Turns out that the Audit Chamber had the resources to actually conduct audits but someone in government didn't want the audits to, make, uh, to be made public because it made the government look bad. And so uh, from this stance, uh, holding the government accountable for the spending of government money, um, for the spending of public money is going to be impossible. So this need, need to be, uh, the institutions need to, to be reformed and, and strengthened. The National Audit Chamber, the Public Accounts Committee in the National Legislature, um, the Anti-Corruption Committee uh, Commission needs to be empowered to do its job. Morgan? Um, I would agree with all of the things that uh, civil society borders are going to be supremely important and affect everything else. Um, institutional reform needs to happen. Uh, I think I would add, uh, in terms of if we're thinking long, long term, next five to ten years, we need to be thinking now about what the elections are going to look like at the end of this agreement. 
Um, I think sort of one of the worst things that could happen is we get to the end of this and we have non-democratic elections and it just throws us into sort of the same old cycle. Um, and I think international support is going to be critical to making sure that those elections are democratic, that everyone has a chance to vote. Um, so, and, and it's going to take a while to get the infrastructure in place to be able to carry out those elections. So we need to be thinking about it early. I think there's a really good point on, on the elections. We often forget that that is meant to be the off-ramp to the peace agreement. We also often forget that that is what sparked this violence in the first place. And so um, I, I would argue in my moderator prerogative that <laughs> the risk is less about non-democratic elections. The risk is about how do you manage the competition for who carries the flag. And I, I think that's something that we haven't even started to put on the table the SPLM flag. Um, I agree with everything they mentioned. Um, but I will also just want to add that, um, so one of the things that I really don't want to lose sight is the accountability for atrocities that were committed because myself, I lost my mother in 2013 and I have been willing to, to you know, to, to first advocate for fees and end to the violence knowing that those who committed the atrocities will still be held accountable you know, for their crime. And for doing that, it will create, I do think it will serve as a deterrent. So when we get to the election, somebody might think twice because the situation in South Sudan continue to get worse because we put out these, you know, through UN and international community, these sanction individual, uh, targeted sanction, but they have no mechanism to, to make it stick. So it, until we make some individual pay for what they have done, it is just another, you know, a crime or another, um, uh, you know, uh, person name uh, that has been put in the UN sanction. So I really want to make sure that we don't lose sight with this idea of accountability for atrocities. At the same time, we also need to find ways, as we focus on civil society and, 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 and putting resources if, in, to develop uh, civil society leadership skills, there is also has to be a way to find how to marriage the diaspora and, and the civil society back on the ground. Because one of the things that all of you might be aware of is that social media, particularly Facebook, in other parts of the world it is used for holding government accountable, for organizing rallies like what we saw in Hong Kong over the weekend. But in the context of South Sudan, social media, particularly Facebook, has been very divisive. You have South Sudanese going on social media for four or five hours. And what they are saying in that, and Brian can attest to this, is that they are just lashing out to the other tribe or to the other you know, political opposition that they disagree with. So as South Sudanese in the next five years going forward, we need to find ways you know, to break those barriers in, on how to use social media because Social media can be used in a positive way rather than the way it has been used in a negative way. So I also really think that the United States and, and partners uh, need to focus on high-level diplomatic efforts. One of the guarantors for the agreement, which is Bashir, is not lo is longer no there, is not there. And so now the only guarantor is Museveni. And how do we trust that he's going to be an honest breaker? So there has to be a high level focus from international community to make sure that all of these things that we talk about are being implemented. So that bridges perfectly to my last question, actually, because you can't have a conversation um, in the United States without asking what, what should the United States be doing to, to help to get South Sudan on a path towards peace. And um, as you all know, there's been a lot of criticism about um, the, what's perceived as the lack of support by the United States. Um, I think that does not acknowledge the nearly $1 billion of assistance in humanitarian aid that keeps South Sudanese alive um, and who, who, whose food security and fundamental protection is threatened by the, by the civil war itself. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to ask panelists to think through what, what should be prioritized, um, whether it's diplomatic um, assistance. Um, and of course, the United States isn't just the administration. Um, it includes the Congress. It includes other institutions. It includes a role that um, Su South Sudanese Americans can play. Um, so what should be the priorities in action 
Maybe I'll turn to Mark first for this one. Because you already know my answer. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, you're mentioning how much the U.S. is spending now with USAID, uh, especially, um, there's a convening power there based on the amount of money. And there, there's uh, an opportunity for the U.S. administration or Congress or, or whatever comes together to be the convener of all these financial institutions. And that's because the IMF, the U.S. is the largest contributor, African Development Bank, the U.S. is a donor, all these huge institutions which the South Sudanese government is going to turn to or already has turned to for financial assistance, the U.S. has a foot in almost all of them. Um, maybe not in terms of uh, China's development bank or a couple others, but in any case, the U.S. has the ability to bring all these people together and say, we, we have to have a firm and uh, very clear way in which financial uh, assistance is distributed in this country. Because um, I think over time and over a long conflict, there's been an ability of South Sudanese partners as well as international partners to kind of choose, choose the assistance they'd like to deliver or which... And uh, I'm not talking about develop, um, uh, humanitarian assistance here either. I'm talking about development and financial assistance for, for kind of stabilizing or capitalizing their, their economy. And um, with U.S. leadership, I think there's an opportunity there because also, again, it's not putting the U.S. in an uncomfortable spot of feeling like they might get burned again um, if, there is, if there's ability to, to bring these people around the table. Brian, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, my personal opinion here, uh, I think that, there needs to be a modicum of U.S. involvement with the political system in South Sudan. Um, we saw uh, in the run-up to the crisis in December 2013 um, an unfolding of the liberal state-building process in South Sudan. Um, there was a, a lot of focus on the technical aspects of, uh, say, transforming the army, helping, you know, on that front. But then, uh, the international community totally overlooked the political side, the, the brewing contest for uh, control of the state by the rival factions in the ruling party. So uh, despite high level um, you know, people coming from South Sudan to DC to say, hey, um, stuff is going to happen which is going to be really, really bad and we need someone to step in. Uh, uh, that process was overlooked and um, so it should not repeat itself um, this time around. For other reasons too, even for the national security interests of the US. Um, if you look at the national security policy or strategy of the Trump administration, it states very clearly that instability in East and Central Africa poses a threat to the US uh, and its allies. And so when you have instability in a region that is, in a country that is basically a ward of the United States, and I, and I think that that brings uh, in um, another problem because it compromises that intention in the national security uh, strategy. Not only that, uh, we have seen an increased involvement of um, great powers in that region uh, whose interest, interests don't necessarily align with the interests of the United States. And therefore, um, if the United States recedes completely from involvement in the political process in South Sudan, I think that creates uh, an opportunity for other malign powers to um, get involved. And that, in the long term, I don't think is um, conducive or good for the interests of the United States. Thanks, Brian. Morgan? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with what, what my colleague said. Um, I think there's there's a need for, for some high-level pressure on the parties, as we mentioned, in order to uh, push them to actually implement the agreement. Um, I think what you said about uh, the um, sort of citizens being the guarantors of the agreement is real, but they need our support to be able to do that. Um, so we need to continue to support them. And also I think, I, I don't think it went unnoticed that the, the United States didn't sign and that was a little bit of a blow that, that the US might not be there to help the citizens to f hold their leaders accountable. Um, as was mentioned, I think everyone's watching very closely what's happening in Sudan, and they're worried about Bashir being gone and not not being a guarantor anymore, and what that does to the to the um, power balance between Museveni and, and Bashir holding holding the leaders accountable. Um, so I think there's a lot up in the air. Uh, China's obviously moving in. I think it'll be important to continue sort of making our our voice heard and and that we care. 
some people have argued that we should start to talk differently about um, the political leadership in the country and talk about them as the political class um, and reserve the term leadership for the people who are truly showing leadership towards peace. Um, and that's, you know, that's how we use words, but maybe that starts to matter um, because we also consistently hear um, a sense of um, betrayal, a lack of confidence, a lack of trust between the United States and South Sudanese political leaders. Um, but uh, I don't think, th I'm concerned that that's also um, impacting on the relationship with the people who share the values, the principles, um, and the ideas that the United States has always supported in South Sudan and our, our central. Um, Dr. Emily, we're, you have the last word on this before we open it up to, to questions. What, in, in your view, should the United States be focused on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in addition to what uh, colleagues on the panel have expressed, um, I just want to be <laughs> very exact on diplomatic, uh, uh, on the diplomatic engagement, uh, that what I see is that uh, the government in Cuba, and not just the government, but also parties, they are seeing uh, much to them is indifference from the U.S. government towards them and the whole peace process. Uh, they they express uh, that in different ways. Uh, some of it is to come, for example, to an RGMF meeting and say anybody who is not a signatory should not sit in a RGMF meeting, for example. And that is not uh, constructive uh, for the U.S. government, but also generally the Troika and other guarantors to to continue engaging in the peace process. So again, as many have said that until today, if we do not get a direct channel between Washington and Juba, it's still going to be detrimental to the entire engagement. It will defeat even the purpose of the humanitarian assistance that goes on to the ground. Because much as they are diplomats on the ground, they do not have adequate engagement with, uh, <laughs> with Juba. And the Juba, Juba seems to want a bigger, <laughs> something bigger, and there are entrepreneurs who are ready to exploit that situation, as we saw with the Gainful Solution Saga. Uh, the other thing that I want to add is uh, the U.S. government, having been the pen holder for what we saw on uh, 30th last month, or was it last month, or, or uh, that's uh, for the sanctions. Uh, targeted sanctions, it's important to follow through because those are the only tools of accountability we have at the moment besides what we hope we hope to see later as the hybrid court being formed and other mechanisms of, the, of chapter five. At the moment, we only have those tools. Uh, IGAD has not been able to punish any spoilers, neither has uh, the African Union. And so when we should see the U.S. government follow through uh, enforcement of uh, these accountability measures and uh, get folks who have embezzled resources and there are even others who are still embe embezzling resources that are meant for implementation of the peace agreement and get their assets frozen. Uh, but at the same time also acknowledge the steps that are being made by the leadership. Uh, when the president makes a step to relieve an official who is thought to be uh, to not be transparent, uh, it's it's important that uh, he is lauded for that. And then the uh, other, the third thing I would add is uh, continue to focus on uh, 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 going after this whole illicit financial flaws because besides those who are already targeted, there those who are not on the list and they are still mismanaging our resources. And we continue to hear the song that there are no resources for implementation of the peace agreement. And I think those are the things I would say the U.S. government should focus on. Great. Um, we are going to open it up to the audience. We, we made this a two-hour conversation. We usually do an hour and a half. So thank you to everybody for the time that you've given. But I hope you'll agree it was worthwhile to dig into some of these issues a little bit deeper. Um, I'm going to ask people to keep their questions or comments short. Um, we'll take a couple at a time, and then we'll turn to our, our panelists to do responses. I'm going to keep an eye on anything on, on Twitter for those who want to jump in. OK, I'm going to take uh, a first set in this section, so at the very back. Dane Smith from AFREX. 
pass it on. I heard a surprising statement. At least it was surprising to me. Civil society in South Sudan is very strong. Uh, that seems to go against uh, much of the analysis that was being given uh, about the, uh, the peace situation. Uh, is that an evolution over the last couple of years? Uh, I would be interested in some analysis of how that has occurred, if it has occurred. Also, I'm particularly interested in uh, the role of the churches. Uh, nothing has been said this morning about uh, the churches. We had a major uh, dramatic event uh, in the Vatican not too long ago in which the two leaders were brought together and the Pope actually got down on his knees and kissed their shoes. Um, so I'm interested in uh, hearing some more about the civil society and the role of the churches uh, in this process of uh, peace building, including accountability. Thanks. Um, we're going to take one up here. Sorry, I'm going to make a walk. <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> I can't give you my mic. <laughs> then I lose all prerogative as moderator if I give you my mic. <laughs> Let's try to save time. Yeah, uh, my name is Samuel Akau, and um, I'm actually very pleased to hear all the, the different uh, angles that you have brought to the issue. And I just wanted to highlight like some of the two things that I didn't hear so much about that I think are critical to sustainable peace in South Sudan. <clears throat> and the one is that the trust, I think, is the most underlying uh, principle that if you don't have that, regardless of all the documents, agreements you do, you know, everything will just break down. And we saw that in 2016 <clears throat> because Riek and Kir um, didn't have that. And so very dangerously uh, situation was created. And so in this peace agreement that's being signed, um, we now have the country splintered, all different groups. And I'm not seeing a trust uh, happening. We now have four vice presidents that you've said. And as we build towards the next election, I foresee a situation where each of them is actually trying to build, um, build like uh, their loyalty and trying to create an environment where they would be electable, including Kir himself trying to, uh, to do the same. And so if they keep undermining each other and they don't see the peace as a priority, as important for their individual gains, they will just keep undermining each other and everything will fall uh, down apart. So what is actually being done to make sure that this exists and creates a, um, an opportunity for that? And then the other question is on the issue of the private sector. If we saw the conflict in 2013, it seems like it was political, but at the same time it was resource driven because we had the oil shut down in 2012. And the government, the way Kir has been building the government around at the time was trying to buy loyalty from people. So we have generals, people being put in the military, and resources being used to actually buy loyalty from people. So when the resources actually began to shrink, there was an opportunity for most people to actually, they lost, you know, and everybody wanted to be around the president and have all that loyalty. So you see a lot of discontent. And so those people who were discontent with the government, they created their own uh, groups, they formed their own um, groups to actually challenge Kiel towards the election. And so we saw that in December. That was one of the reasons a lot of people who were disgruntled with the government did that. So as this culture has actually been created in South Sudan where people see government as the only opportunity for making money for, uh, for wealth. And so what is being done to ensure that we open up the country, we open up the private sector, we create infrastructure so that people who necessarily don't want power can go and do something elsewhere to, uh, to be self-sufficient. Thank you. Great, thanks for those questions. And then there's... My name is Miriam. I'm from American University. Um, the, I want to thank the panel for all the insights. Um, and clearly, there's a crisis of governance. And I wanted to bring about, uh, I didn't hear people mentioning about federal federalism. And it's not a new issue in South Sudan. Um, so I was, because the current government, which is in Juba, it has fairly responsibilities towards the 
uh, people both in the state level and the county level. So I was wondering um, if federalism is an important aspect of this peace agreement in the sense that if you can have people uh, be able to benefit within their states and then to feel like marginalized and it will sort of also help reduce the tensions happening in Juba, especially according uh, to these tribal issues and, um, and fight for resources. Great, so that's a pretty broad round of questions. Um, I'm gonna ask that panelists don't answer every single question, but, what, but ones that, where you think you have uh, something particular to add. So um, maybe we can start with the private sector question. Is that, Mark, is that something you wanna jump in on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I agree with your assessment that the, the way the private sector has worked at this point, it's become predatory, it's exclusionary. Um, there's a fight for control of the resources, which sparked, uh, in in my opinion, a lot of this uh, conflict itself. Um, I'll return to Chapter Four, which um, it, it's meant to be there to make for a more accountable economy and one that's trustworthy and that people can feel um, when they return, uh, IDPs or, or refugees return, that there's actual a, a level of of governance that allows for them to reinvest into their, their own country. So it's not just big investors coming in, which unfortunately is a long way off, um, uh, but it's returning um, and on a personal level, I mean, you, you also talked about trust. Um, it's, it's the trust to go back to your community and, the, and to have a line of credit, have banks reopen. You know, all this requires um, um, a fair amount of institution building that won't happen overnight but it's important now to lay that groundwork. Great. Um, maybe to the civil society question and the role of the churches, I'll look to Morgan and then turn to Dr. Emily. If others want to weigh in, that's great. Yeah, um, I think you're absolutely right that there's been an evolution of, of civil society over recent years, um, and we've seen them take on a much more active and, and effective role. In particular, in recent years, I think they've recognized the power of coalitions. Um, a few years ago, the NGO world was very siloed. Everyone was competing for money. They're still competing for money, but they have, um, they're doing a much better job of working together, particularly in issues like advocating for implementation of the peace agreement, where they are more vulnerable when they work alone. And when they work together, they're more effective and they're a little bit less vulnerable. Um, and when they do that, they often work together with the churches. The churches do have sort of a, a little bit more leeway to speak more openly. Um, and, and they've definitely taken on a big role in the revitalization process. Um, so I think they're gonna to continue to be an important actor to work with in order to pr put pressure on the leaders. Um, and I, I guess I would also, I would point to Dr. Emily as an excellent example of, of the strength of civil society. She's been an incredible voice um, and effort within, within the civil society, so I would let her respond as well. Great. Dr. Emily, would you like to share any reflections on that question? Yes, I, I think when when uh, when 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 we say civil society is strong, uh, it, it's not to say that it's perfect and it does not have any challenges. Uh, what we are trying, what we are saying is that uh, you there is a civil society that is proactive, a civil society that is trying to do so much uh, amidst uh, uh, funding constraints. Uh, like uh, it's been said that. Uh, <laughs> There is some semblance of scrambling over uh, resources, but at the same time, we are able to meet and do so much in relation to this peace agreement without necessarily a partner putting money into our bank accounts uh, as organizations or as coalitions. And that has been happening. We schedule meetings, people transport themselves, we draft, we, we draft, uh, we draft something that colleagues who are in the mechanisms of the peace agreement are, are supposed to do, and that is commendable. It's a very good spirit. It's something that you can associate uh, with, a, with a strong civil society. But all that is happening in, a, in, in an environment where uh, there, is, there is infringement on the freedom of association. You simply can't just convene a meeting for more than six hours without notifying the National Security Service. And that meeting also, some individuals, if they are known to be attending that meeting, then it can't happen. 
So it's, we can commend that the civil society is strong by virtue of being able to operate in those circumstances. But of course, there are challenges. We need some capacity building. We are overwhelmed. We are not so many. And there is so much work to do there. The field is just very wide. And the church, the role of the church, uh, the church has been very instrumental in engaging the holdout groups. Uh, although somehow it had, uh, has taken the lead, uh, the church has had some a bit of what appears to be parallel mechanisms of its own, besides, of course, what happened uh, in Vatican a few months ago. So at the moment, that's the role of the church. But civil society is always uh, keen on engaging uh, the, the church in everything that it does uh, in relation to the peace process. Just to clarify that, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Emily. And, and maybe if I can, I'll just point people towards some examples of non-formal participation in the peace process. The, the South Sudan we want that you alluded to, Brian, and people may not have picked up is this tremendous series of video interviews with South Sudanese articulating their vision for the future of the country. Um, and so if you Google that, you'll find a series on, on YouTube. That was also part of the event we did two years ago. Um, and then Ana Taban, which translates as I'm tired, I've had enough, um, has been the anchor of a nonviolent movement to try to think through how you can use art um, and music to, to express what people want to see for their future. Um, and it's going beyond just you know, painting murals in Juba, which is important itself, but is helping to rethink how citizens engage with our government. And so I'll commend to you also a short report that our colleagues have written on nonviolent action in, in South Sudan as, as further example of where, where civil society really, I think, is, is evolving. Um, David, do you want to Yeah, um, I just want to add the idea that civil society is strong. I, I think it comes from uh, civil society in South Sudan has learned to adapt how they operate. And they have moved to this, they, uh, you can call it a dark web. So in the state of a few years ago where people try to organize in Cuba and then the national security will come and arrest people and beat you up, what they do now in civil society is they use a space like WhatsApp. And you have a group of civil society organizing from Cuba with those in Nairobi and including those who are even outside uh, the, the African continent. So there is the great deal of civil society activities has been moved. Uh, uh, using social media, so they organize without being, you know, being identified, and that kind of count to the strength of the civil society operation, activism. Brian, I know we share a love of federalism, so I'm going to turn to you okay. for see if you'd like to comment on that question. Um, sure. I mean, uh, federalism is um, articulated in the peace agreement, and um, indeed, it's been a demand of uh, the South Sudanese for a very, very long time. Um, there was a process uh, to sort of um, um, to initiate the process uh, again. Let me just back up a bit. Um, there was a federal system when the country became independent. There were 10 states. Um, apparently, those states were not enough. There were people who were agitating for more states. And um, the uh, I think that a lot of the there are both genuine reasons uh, for uh, the creation of more states, I think, um, and then there are also reasons that are uh, f to advance the political interests of uh, individuals. And what happened then was the way that new states were uh, created after the first peace agreement was signed in uh, 2015 and then it, it collapsed, was done in a very opportunistic way. Uh, by the president to show up his support base. And that in, in itself ended up creating more problems. And I think going forward, then the South Sudanese need to um, sit down and think through a process of what kind of federalism they want. And um, I think the mechanisms for that would also come through something like a national dialogue. We have a national dialogue process going on right now, but that, in my opinion, is not like a very good process, although there's been some good stuff that has come out of it, but I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's been advanced for the political purposes of uh, entities in government, and I, I think a genuine national dialogue would answer the question, what type of federalism do we want? How many states do we want? The current states are just 
don't don't cut it basically yeah, and I think it's helpful to highlight that this question of states and boundaries goes back to a fundamental question of how is governance organized. Um, and I think one of the challenges in the peace agreement right now is that it doesn't leave a lot of space for that meaningful dialogue about the number of states and how it relates to governance. It, it forces a, a decision on the number of states very early. All right, we're going to open up to another round of questions. Um, I have one, two, and three. Thank you very much. My name is Timothy Towell. That was a wonder. My question is going to be about your phrase, dynamic phrase, revitalize the peace process. I spent 30 years in that big funny building across the street, the State Department. Uh, I retired as an ambassador, and I just spent two days in Juba a month ago. Uh, spent two days with the president. He had a cowboy hat on. Uh, and his cabinet, who is very articulate, my only problem with the cabinet, they're very articulate, but my friend, the Minister of Defense, I'm five foot seven, he was this tall, tall and when he lectured me, he intimidated me. Uh, the idea of the international community and what we can do as opposed to what you can do in your country. Uh, the international community, boy, they don't look good down there. They're hidden behind barbed wire. Get out. If you get shot, tough. Or get a different job if you don't like to bring peace to a wonderful country and a wonderful people. My question is the role of international community, but not those guys behind barbed wire. We read in fake news every day of the problems in Sudan. Who's messing around in Sudan? The Saudi Arabians. Those are the people that shot uh, Khashoggi, as you remember. Uh, they're bagging money to the nasty guy from Darfur, whatever his name is. Uh, and when we met with the, pres the wonderful president of South Sudan, Two days, he excused himself the second day, got on his private plane, and flew to where? Saudi Arabia. What commitments, international community, did he get from those bastards in, South, in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates? Who of your experts, madam expert, are tracking what the Sudanese, Saudi Arabians are doing in South Sudan? How much was in the briefcase, French briefcase, of that distinguished president of South Sudan when he flew back on his expensive private plane? Who's tracking that rather than talking about what we all know here? Thank you very much. Thank you. I will immediately point you to a report that's outside looking at the engagement of the Gulf countries in South Sudan and the Horn of Africa. So, um, and I think it's also notable that you mentioned the president's hat, because uh, some people have argued that the United States should go and take the hat back um, <laughs> as a point of leverage. I've already called George W. Bush's office and told him about the hat. No, don't take the hat back. Have Bush go to the man that the funny hairdo in the White House and tell him to get his hat back. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Atem Malak. Uh, I'm with IRI and in South Sudanese, of course. So I, I have uh, an observation and a, a question in a way. So when you guys talk about the question of financial accountability with the government, I think there's something that we are missing and is that people in South Sudan for a long time have had this idea that if you are in the government, it doesn't matter whether you are a political elite or somebody from a cattle camp. If you are in the government, you are there to enrich yourself. That is the mentality of people. You are there to enrich yourself. And then it's not also helped by the fact that if you are in the government, there's no job security. So when you are in this political position, you are put there. And if you are there for two months, you are grabbing everything you can. And then when you are fired, you are a rich man or a rich woman for that matter. So there is a need for our people to be educated on what is the role of the government. If you are in the government, what is it that you are supposed to do for the people? And then 
for the people, what, what should they do to hold the uh, uh, government accountable? Pretty much a social contract to pe for people to understand that idea. Uh, I think there is need of our people to understand that. And if we talk about let's hold government accountable from international community, it's going to be very hard because if the people don't know what their government is supposed to do, there's nothing that international community can do. So that is my first observation. Uh, there is uh, another aspect of uh, this um, federalism that people were talking about earlier. And my second question was uh, asked by my friend, but I want to add the idea of this federalism. South Sudan is a polarized country uh, with many, many tribes that don't trust each other. So let's say we have this federalism uh, put in our mix in this society that doesn't trust each other. Are we not creating a tribal state that will make South Sudan ungovernable? Thanks. I'm going to take a couple more. Okay. 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 Thank you for the chance. Um, good Gabriel Manyang. I share the greater panel concern used for peace and stability in South Sudan. And I'm here, uh, I came in for uh, Amphrey Fellowship, which I'm done with. I'm, I thank God I have done with. Uh, <coughs> one is a comment. What should United States do at this moment on uh, implementation of peace agreement? Uh, quickly, I myself, plus other South Sudanese, we believe that who brought South Sudan to be a nation was the United States, despite we fought for. But the United States play a role to get us where we are. So people still have a faith, people still believe that the United States can do something uh, for their, uh, to, to help them in their suffering. So what I want to suggest in this is that, uh, yes, Pope did a good job calling the, uh, the two leaders, uh, several leaders to Vatican, but still, I still believe that uh, if the United States again could call these leaders, bring them here, and tell them this is our position, you go and put it somewhere else. I think the citizen will still follow them and say, you went to the United States you listen to this, you don't do it, then I think it will help. My question is that, uh, yes, there are civil society movements that contribute issues, which I am one of them, but I realize that uh, the mechanism the government of South Sudan use uh, is a most dangerous mechanism. Wherever there are progress, they jam in, they create loophole so that you don't function well. So the civil society that are in South Sudan now, there are also a lot of issues that are going on. And uh, we, we, care, we came in uh, to neglect the real people on the ground. And this situation, I feel like, can we have anything that can empower the people from the grassroots not us from Juba, not somebody who come to United States like me, but also the, those societies on the grassroots. So that they, they start holding accountable their leaders from Payam County, state. When it comes from there, the government will have no option in Juba. But otherwise, if we uh, keep accountable uh, government of Juba, they will also put the problem, like the tribal fighting that is going on, it is a political issue. It is, it is not just a, a tribal. They just push the war away from Juba to the grassroots so that uh, they say, no, 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 we are not part of it. But they are the ones creating it. Thank you. Great. There's a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. 
you. Um, my name is Sandra and I have a couple of questions. So something you said stuck out to me, which is that it's less about an undemocratic election when we get to that point and it's more about who's going to bear the flag of the SPLM. And so my question is, I would like to hear like reflections on that. We've seen in the past few months a few groups who've kind of folded back in line and joined um, the government, so SPLM. Um, what do you think that changes as far as the calculus um, looks like in terms of elections? Um, and then my second question is, um, a lot of people, you know, speak about the conflict in South Sudan as, you know, in ethnic terms, it's, you know, a lot of tribes that are fighting against one another. My question is, does that, is that a too simplistic a way of looking as what, at what's going on in South Sudan? And how can we problematize the context of that conflict and think about what is it really is that is at the heart of that um, tension within South Sudan? I think reducing it to tribalism and to different um, tribal identities gets us to miss a lot of things that are um, at play. So, thank you. I would love to hear it also. Thanks. Um, we'll take one more question. I want to get somebody at the very back. And then we'll do a final round of, of responses from our, our panelists. My name is Elizabeth. Thank you. For the chance, um, I'm just visiting the States. I'm an economist by profession and an activist by passion. So um, although I lived in South Sudan for almost five years, I have learned so much today from my brother Brian, particularly in the, in the context of security and how the security sector is in South Sudan. Um, what I just have to say now is um, when people talk about the role of the U.S. in, this, um, in supporting the peace in South Sudan or bringing about peace, I think we should look behind and beyond humanitarian aid um, because providing um, vaccines or providing food for the, for the hungry is not enough, is not going to end the war. So um, I myself and I'm sure other South Sudanese also expect, um, expect to see um, effective diplomatic and political engagement and um, this can be done by lobbying for pushing decision makers and um, holding them accountable. Um, the issue of holding leaders accountable has been discussed by many, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. But I also believe that there cannot be um, a total state of peace in South Sudan without um, economic stability. And this cannot happen if the government don't go after these corrupt leaders and bring, about, bring back the money that is looted and diverted outside the country. And the government is not going to do that because simply they are the ones who are doing this. And here where um, I think the IMF and the US and the international community role comes in, whereby they can just force and put more pressure. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to turn back to the panelists. I'm going to ask them to keep their intervention short. Um, Brian looks like he's ready to run, so Brian, <laughs> okay. lead us forward. Um, uh, let me just uh, look at the question on government as a looting scheme. People see it as a, um, uh, you know, as a way to get rich quickly. I think that this is embedded in the South Sudanese psyche, and that arises from the fact that since 1840, when the concept of government was first introduced in South Sudan, it's all been about predatory uh, practices. Um, the people who had the jobs were the people who worked for government. Uh, the people who had the nice houses were the people who worked for government. And the colonial administrations, starting from the Turco-Egyptian, Anglo-Egyptian, uh, sorry, the Turkish and the Anglo-Egyptian and the post-independent um, Sudanese state and currently the SPLM government have devoted absolutely no effort to building other sectors of the economy. So everything that is viable that seems to earn money is from the government and that's why everyone wants to go to government. When I was a kid, we used to pull these toys we play with on the on the ground and, and, on the, uh, and you, you're supposed to handle them delicately but when you don't, um, we say in Arabic, Mahagi Haga Hakuma. It's not mine, it's, for the, it's the government. So the, the government is viewed, this is like for a nine year old, the government is viewed as this object or entity from which you can take. Okay? It's Im embedded in our psyche in South Sudan, and that needs to change. And that process needs uh, to change with accountability measures being enacted. Um, 
reflections on uh, the flag bearers. Um, at this particular moment, uh, there is no indication of who is going to do what. But um, I was listening to the president speak uh, recently when um, he inaugurated this uh, E something, and he and and the red flag uh, movement was up. Uh, the red card movement was up on social media, and the regime was in a tiffy because of that. He said, um, you know, he said that if anyone wants to uh, uh, to he is not sticking to power. Uh, he denied that. He said that when his time comes, he will leave. But he wants to leave in a proper way, and that that can only be in elections. And anyone who wants the seat of power must come through elections. So there was no clue uh, in his speech whether he was going to run or not. Um, so we will leave it at that. And also, when you look at well, Riek Machar, we haven't had any indications. I think it's too early. But I think you can bet um, that um, you know the trend is for them uh, for for a continuation of the status quo, and I, I will not be very surprised if the president says he's going to run for an election. Tribes, um, yes. So one last one, Brian. Then I'm going to turn it over to others so that we can okay. bring everyone in. Absolutely, <laughs> very good point. It's very simplistic to focus on on tribes as. Uh, a driver of conflict or ethnicity itself as a, a, a there is nothing there is no primordial sense of difference among South Sudanese people that makes them go at each other's throats um, it, you know it's not it's not the ethnicity ethnicity is a byproduct of other um, intrigues at play in the political system in South Sudan and, and if you're a scholar if you're a follower an analyst on South Sudan that's something that you need to incorporate into your analysis beyond the ethnicity lens thank you great Mark do you want to come in next? sure uh, yeah I'll pick up a little bit where Brian left off on uh, the financial accountability question I appreciate it um, I think there's actually two things at play um, there is this belief of what is the government for Service delivery is not seen as uh, as necessarily what the government is all about, um, but then there's this issue that it's it's um, there are issues of petty corruption everywhere, but it's the the grand corruption that has devastating effects on the country as a whole, which I think are where there can be a rally, and that's where the civil society might have a role. So if you it's old, but I think if I say the Dura saga, that means a lot. That means some a lot of people, and it was massive amounts of money, hundreds of millions of dollars that was um, taken away from, from, the, from the South Sudanese people. Um, these sort of, uh, of examples of what can happen um, are probably uh, necessary to get into the public discussion a little bit more because the fear is that this just happens again. It did happen again with the letters of credit scheme between 2013 and 2015. And so there's a real reason why uh, um, there, the international community has this kind of push for accountability and transparency. Um, but this might be an opportunity as well for South Sudan to say, hey, isn't it time there's a national audit on all the natural resources? And it's public, and it's a third party, and everyone can take a look and say, this is where it is. And we can see who owns everything. Um, it might show what we already suspect, but having it out in the open is a good way of having true, um, uh, hitting the issue of corruption head on instead of it kind of being sitting in the background where it's something that exists. Uh, I think it seems to be seen as something that's more core to how you um, can kind of make a lasting peace. Morgan, did you want to come in on questions related to elections or, or any other aspect? Um, I would maybe just build on the, the point about um, tribal divisions being too simple. I think you're, you're absolutely right and that that's sort of one of the uh, areas that we need to make sure that in our focus on the peace agreement national level that we don't lose sight of how complex this conflict is and all the different sort of factors uh, driving it including in particular the economic issues um, a lot of a lot of the local level conflicts are just over resources um, and so making sure that we're we're sort of building local level resilience and ways of coping with um, those issues of sharing resources in the absence of the government coming in and implementing the reforms in the in the agreement, um, and so that they can start making progress from the grassroots while the national level stuff is also happening. Great, David. Uh, one of the things that we have not talked about and is also going on uh, is the SPLM reunification process, which came out of the Arusha agreement, 
And as we speak right now, there is actually an ongoing uh, uh, reunific reunification process to which, number one, they want to increase the number of National Liberation Council and also the political bureau. And the success of that SPLM reunification actually will indicate where we will go with the elections after, you know, the, 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 at, after the, the formation of transitional government of national unity. Whether Kir will run or whether he will not run, the problem also here is that everybody that is either in government or in a position claim to be SPLM. Therefore, a focus on reunifying SPLM could actually lead to that party because this is where the problem actually came out in 2013. So now that Madam Rebecca has been appointed as the head of the committee and she's leading the reform of the National Liberation Council and the National Liberation Council is the one that actually nominate the candidate for presidency. You know, and they are the one who in those who will share the party and, and also put together the element of the party. So that process is going along alongside the revitalized agreement. So I just wanted to put that. And um, the point about Saudi Arabia, I think that is transactional relationship. And uh, I don't think anybody is monitoring it. So it, 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 there is a concerted effort in Cuba to try to find friends because they believe the United States doesn't want to engage with them. And one of the people that has actually extended the hand is China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. Um, great. Uh, before I turn to Dr. Emily, um, there was a question from online about where weapons are coming from. Um, and so I'm just going to refer people to the panel of the UN panel of experts report because they really do the an outstanding job of of documenting evidence um, and trying to to track the analysis on, on those questions. So that can be found on the, the UN's website. I think I don't think anybody on this panel would, would want to wade into that necessarily. Um, so Dr. Emily, um, the last word to you on any of the questions that are there or any, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Uh, yes, quickly. Uh, colleagues have, uh, have responded to most of them elaborately. I just want to start with Sandra's on uh, uh, lots of tribes fighting and the, the underlying issues why people are fighting, although I want to admit that not everything can be addressed by the uh, present peace agreement. Uh, the, for example, the cattle rustling, the issues between farmers and uh, and uh, and, the, and the cattle keepers. Those are things that can be uh, resolved by, for example, getting the traditional leadership on the ground at the grassroots, uh, being engaged by the church leaders and uh, civil society to to forge a way forward. Uh, besides whatever else is happening with this agreement, uh, there have been issues that have been highlighted within the national dialogue uh, process, the reports we've seen, and there are several issues therein. And then to my brother, who's just finished uh, his Humphrey Fellowship, I just want to congratulate you. You make many of us proud, and that's where I hope is, seeing people like you. And the U.S. government can continue supporting young people in South Sudan with that kind of support. But to your question about... Uh, civil society, what you described is infiltration of civil society. But also I want to, again, be honest and say, I do not know a country where uh, government does not try to weaken civil society or infiltrate civil society. Civil society simply has to continue to adapt to the challenges uh, at, at, at a particular time and forge forward. We are going to still continue to experience this infiltration uh, by uh, the government. And for us to be able to forge on, of course, we need flexible uh, funding uh, to avert certain situations that, you, again, you describe where uh, some people have argued we do not have a state, but what is really true is, not, is we are not yet a nation as such. We identify ourselves with our tribes, and we still do not identify ourselves as South Sudan, and some, some, <laughs> some investment has to be done uh, in that. The rest of the things are not... I would not comment. I think colleagues have have really tackled those. I request to say goodbye and rush for another meeting. It's been a privilege to engage with all of you. 
Dr. Emily, thank you so much, and thank you for spending so much time with us um, without being in the room. We, we really appreciate your, your insights. Um, and let me thank um, all of our panelists for what I think has been a very um, sobering, but also concrete conversation about what, what it is that can be done. Um, and, and for me, I certainly walk away with uh, Dr. Emily's message that peace is possible here. We, there is um, leverage to hold the political class to account. There's um, energy and organization and ideas within South Sudanese civil society. There are mechanisms that we can, can use in the economic governance sector to advance some of these fundamental challenges. Um, and that in many ways we have to bring all of that to bear on the questions of the security sector to open up the space for the various other reforms that need to take place. So um, let me thank all of you for all the time that you spent with us this morning for your questions, your comments, and the, the spirit of dialogue that people brought into the room. Um, and please join me in thanking our, our panelists.